to everyone. Welcome to everyone. Thank you very much. I wanted to give a brief board update. A uh, couple items uh, to let you know about. Armis has a merger with Health Catalyst. We had a nice conversation with Jula today um, and nothing will change from our perspective. Um, the system should actually be uh, a bit more robust and we will uh, keep people informed as we go along. Uh, at this point, no change in contracting or anything is anticipated. Uh, the next item was, uh, is that VCSQI will be partnering with uh, VHHA, Virginia Hospital Healthcare Association to reduce readmissions for cabbage patients. And hopefully this will kick off later in the month. We are also engaged in the partnership with VHAC and VCSQI as a formal relationship. Uh, we have um, enhanced through Armis the STEMI database. Uh, we have 17 sites with chest pain MI and we're merging the AHA get with the guidelines uh, information as well. And so we shall have more information, a little bit presented later today and then more information as we move forward. Uh, TVT, uh, Armis is certified. Uh, we are testing uploads from one site and we have nine of the 13 to 14 centers in our Commonwealth already engaged. And uh, once we're comfortable with the uh, uploads, we will uh, have all of the uh, other participating sites upload data. We are also looking at the cost data as we have with CAF PCI and doing a lot of the matching and we will move forward with TVT and some of the continued surgical uh, data. From uh, the financial update, um, we are doing well. We have about 85% of the 2022 dues already collected. Uh, and I think we are uh, proceeding. Uh, lastly, we talked also briefly about uh, diversity and inclusion so that that uh, does not fall off our radar. And there will more, uh, be more to follow on that at upcoming uh, meetings. Uh, I welcome any questions or you can email or send a question in the chat link or reach out to Eddie or Sherry if there are any additional uh, questions about any of the items that we've talked about. And that is my board summary. Thanks, Dr. Shore. And I'm just gonna back up a couple of slides here um, just to go over some housekeeping items, um, as well as just put our BCSQI strategic plan on the screen for just a second here. So like Dr. Shore mentioned, we want to formally welcome you all to our BCSQI virtual quarterly meeting this evening. Tonight, we've got a dynamic team of providers from across the Commonwealth. who will speak on different components on uh, coronary revascularization. And ultimately, VCSQI's goal is to build consensus approaches to improve patient care. And tonight, you'll see that statewide heart team in action, uh, again, moving toward our mission of transforming cardiovascular care to improve patient experience and value. Um, just going to go back. We heard our updates from the board. Here's our agenda this evening. We'll hear from Dr. O'Brien in just a sec. Um, wanted to show... First of all, the CME credits, if you can please enter your name in the chat uh, and we can go ahead and make sure that you are recorded as far as the CMEs go. Afterwards, we'll send you an email uh, explaining how to claim those credits via the online system and can assist with anything um, as far as the, that administrative piece goes. Uh, you can also enter your questions in the chat at any time and we will be sure to uh, answer them during the Q&A section. And other than that, I think everybody else knows how to use Zoom at this point. We're pretty, we're, we're old pros nowadays, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there, but we, we just want to say that this is an open Zoom meeting, so feel free to take yourselves off of mute, enter your questions in the chat box, uh, just interact, engage. This is a collaborative forum, so we welcome and appreciate all of your feedback and interaction and all your great ideas that you always share with us. So with that, I will tab back forward here. And maybe this is a good place to kick it back over to Dr. O'Brien, who 
of course, is the founder of, uh, co-founder of VHack, and with VHack now kind of formally uh, merging forces, joining forces with VCSQI, we are pleased to show off reports this evening from our VHack VCSQI STEMI database. So Dr. O'Brien is the medical director of Centra Strubant's Heart Center. He's a VCSQI board member. Um, he, again, is the co-founder of VHack and does a lot of other great things too. So Dr. O'Brien, I will turn it over to you for uh, a summary of our STEMI database, where we are and where we're going. Great. Thanks so much, Eddie. Um, for starters, before I get into the data, I'm very excited that we are now official partners with VCSQI. We've uh, been involved more or less uh, with VCSQI for a number of years, and I know a number of people on the call uh, have been with us both in VHack and, and are active VCSQI members as well. This is a natural partnership. I think that we can complement each other's strengths, and we both really are energized and passionate about improving patient outcomes, quality, and, and the delivery of care, better systems of care in the state of Virginia. So we're very, very happy to be officially uh, part of this great organization now. Uh, next slide. So I think most people are familiar, if you've been on the last uh, board meeting calls, you kind of knew this was um, in development, but when the action registry went away, that was, um, uh, a big setback for VHack. That was our benchmarked STEMI database for the state. And you know, you really can't uh, run a QI program without having some uh, data loop feedback. In other words, you have to know how you're doing. So we, uh, we had joined forces with VCSQI to create a basically a new STEMI database, which is now the VHack VCSQI data database. And you can see the data aggregation model right there. Uh, this information is derived from essentially two registries, uh, the ACC's chest pain MI, and soon the American Heart Associations get with the guidelines. Individual hospitals upload their data to ARMIS in order for them to aggregate this data and then report it back. Now, in terms of get with the guidelines, um, we're not quite there yet, but we're very close. I think they're in the final stages. Eddie can comment on this, of being able to map those data points to chest pain MI. And then the data uploader will be built, which shouldn't take too much more time. Um, and I think that'll complete the process. That'll bring those get with the guideline hospitals online, which will increase the number of centers that are reporting. Next slide. So uh, currently we have 17 members that are sharing their chest pain MI data. Uh, quarterly, we're about to get uh, two new members and then we should bring several more on once get with the guidelines is uh, fully operational and they're able to upload that data. Next slide. So we decided when we started this database to try to pick um, a manageable number of high value targets. There's certainly a lot of data points we could look at that we'd like to look at, uh, but we wanted to pick those that we felt really drove quality care or really were the targets of opportunity when it came to STEMI care. And you can see them there. The first is uh, door in, door out, or DIDO time. That's the time spent at the non-PCI hospital before those STEMI patients are transferred to the PCI hospital. The next is transfer time between hospitals. The next is, of course, first medical contact to primary PCI. And again, FMC is when EMS walks in grandma's living room and, and makes contact with the patient. That's when the clock starts until an open artery in the cath lab. The next is, the, and the first way we look at that is percentage under 90 minutes. Um, the next way is the median FMC to primary PCI. Uh, and this is for non-transfer patients. And then finally, pre-hospital EKGs. Uh, of course, that's a very important. You really can't uh, rapidly recognize and reperfuse without a robust pre-hospital EKG program. So this is data over the four quarters of 2021. You can see overall, we're doing pretty well. Uh, the median door in, door out time was 54 minutes. Now, you know, as we know, the uh, goal is less than 45 minutes and actually Medicare says less than 30 minutes, but we know this can be a pretty difficult thing to get done, especially for some of our outlying rural hospitals. So I don't think we're doing too, too badly in that area. We're continuing to work uh, on improving that. The median transfer time between hospitals is actually pretty good, 29 minutes. It's a little shorter than I would have thought. Um, this is a pretty heterogeneous group. This includes transfers that are literally, you know, five to 10 minutes down the street in our urban settings, densely populated areas up to 
um, you, you know, a one hour long transports on country roads for some of our, our rural um, PCI centers. So this varies quite a bit. We're not, uh, again, doing that badly when it comes to uh, percentage less than 90 minutes for first medical contact to primary PCI. We're at 85%. Our goal there is 90% or greater, but again, uh, looking okay. And, uh, and this is um, median FMC to primary PCI has really done surprisingly well uh, down to 73 minutes. It was much higher during the, the peak of COVID. So we're making progress there. And then finally, again, uh, pre-hospital EKGs, you know, the goal there is 100%. That can be difficult. It can be a matter of resources, a matter of uh, EMS training and support. Uh, but I think we're doing well at 88.5%. Now, you can see to the right, we're breaking it, attempting to break it down by regions, which corres uh, correspond to the VHAC regions. We actually don't have all six regions yet. There's a central region uh, around Richmond and, and, and that area, but uh, this gives you a general idea if you divide up the Commonwealth as to how each uh, region is doing. Next slide, please. And uh, of course, we can provide this hospital level uh, data here. It's, uh, if it's all anonymous, but um, if you reach out to Eddie, he can provide you with your, your secret code and you can see how your hospital is doing. Of course, we don't have all the data points from all the hospitals, but we're getting there. And uh, I think overall, you know, there is a good bit of variability, but I think, you know, all in all, the numbers look pretty reasonable, but at least again, it gives us something to work on. Next slide, please. So these are the trend lines for median first medical contact and primary PCI by region and by quarter. And you can see it's a little bit up and down. The data is a little bit scattered. Um, if uh, I could show you, I didn't, didn't want to show too much tonight, but I could probably show you, uh, you know, back during the peak of the COVID pandemic when hospitals were on diversion and resources were really diverted to other projects, uh, these numbers looked a lot worse. I think overall we're doing pretty well. And uh, you can see there, and, and these are some regions that are doing phenomenal work, uh, but there are multiple challenges. You know, if you're in an area of high traffic, it's difficult to transport patients. If you're in an area with uh, large distances between your PCI centers and large uh, transfer times for EMS or for air transport, that's going to be difficult. But I can rest, you can all rest assured that we meet with uh, the leaders of these regions and they're doing some great work. Uh, final slide, please. So this last slide is kind of a, a request and also a recruiting effort. Once upon a time when the action registry was the backbone of VHAC, we were able to get really all the PCI centers. At that time it was about 40 or 42, 24 or seven centers in the state of Virginia signed on. And it really made for an incredibly robust uh, QI database. I think we'll get there with the STEMI registry with VCSQI, but we do have a little ways to go. Of course, we didn't we didn't build Rome. We didn't we didn't do that with Action overnight. It took us three to four years. But I put this up just as a a request or sort of as a plea to stakeholders across the state. Um, you know, please, if you're not already a VCSQI member, if you haven't signed the data use agreements to be part of the STEMI registry and upload that data, we really really implore that you do so. I think this is going to be the, the, the way that STEMI care and quality improvement STEMI care is going to go in Virginia in the future. Um, some updates there, these, these data use agreements actually will be automatically incorporated into the member's database contract. So that is good. And of course, if you're an active member of ECSQI, uh, it's not just STEMI, it's a host of other quality improvement projects that relate to patient outcomes, angiogram reviews, collaborative workshops, and so on. So that is really, in a nutshell, kind of the state state of the state when it comes to STEMI care. Again, we're very excited to bring you this data, and uh, we'll uh, keep coming back and and uh, let you know how things go as we go forward. And that is all I have, Eddie and um, Bob. I will turn it back over to you. Thank you. Any questions for Pete? This is really amazing work, and we're really extremely looking forward to uh, joining the databases to get a better and complete look at the Commonwealth's uh, VHAC data. 
Hi, this is Cindy uh, from Center. I just want to make sure when I'm looking at the current VCSQI members, they're still on board, correct? Sorry, Cindy, can you just clarify that? It's still on so board. When I look at the current Pete's last slide, uh, the current VCSQI members that, that are 28, they are still involved, correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, we have 28 current members okay. who, are, who are signed on in, in either one form or the other in terms yeah. of cardiac surgery and or cardiology. Um, right now, there are 17 centers submitting data to the STEMI database for VCSQI. So not all of our members are, are on um, the STEMI database just yet. We're still kind okay. of drawing some of those uh, data use agreements and, and getting the data um, as well as for the, the Get With The Guidelines only centers. So there's, okay. there's still a few more current members who need to get online. And then the, the second question I have was Pete discussed ARMAS, but um, is this a the point to bring up that Armas has been uh, sold, if you will. Yeah, we we got a presentation. Eddie can speak to that uh, uh, more cogently than I can, but I can tell you that the impression I got uh, from the Armas representative is that it will be no disruption in what they've been able to do for mm -hmm. us. So I think we're not going to see any difficulty with that. They're very committed to the to the projects that are extant right now. Okay, great, because I think yeah. as we move forward with this, we would have to make sure that transition is uh, easy, if you will. Yeah, so we, uh, Julie was on our call on the board meeting um, because obviously we have this, the same concerns that you do. Uh, there should be no changes from our perspective. Um, there, uh, there are no change in the contracting that we've been told. It'll just continue as is, except the new improved Armis will be a little bit more robust than it has been. Jula um, has reaffirmed that it'll, the transition should be seamless uh, for us and continue. Great, but there is a different name. So that's what we have to consider when we're looking to have people engage in this process. Right. Thank right. you. So, so Armis, but there won't be any change in our contracting is what he said. So uh, where we'll see that is a little bit unclear, but as I mentioned in my board update, Armis merged with Health Catalyst and um, there should be no change from the services provided, no degradation, um, no other issues. He also mentioned for your comfort that there was no attrition of any of the Armis staff. They all signed on to the new entity. Um, and there should be no new contracts required for Health Catalyst. They'll honor the current contracts is what he told us. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, Eddie, I don't wanna to take too much time, but I, there's some very good questions in the chat about the Richmond area. Um, just to answer those questions, and if Mike Contos is on, he can as well. Um, Obviously, Richmond has been a very active, uh, the central region, which includes Richmond, has been a very active uh, uh, active participants in VHAC. Um, Eddie, are we going to be able, you, you had explained at one point how we're able to group the hospitals. At some point, we would like to be able to group the hospitals reflective of the actual VHAC region so that if you go to your regional VHAC meeting and you look at this data, you know exactly what applies to you. Absolutely. And, and based on the raw data that we have, we'll be able to group the data uh, and, and the centers by the VHAC regions that we traditionally have. The reason we, you know, on the data slides, we didn't have a central region is because we, we don't have data from any of the central hospitals uh, just yet. You know, we're working on getting them online, but absolutely, we, we presented at some of the local uh, regional VHAC meetings. We presented at the northern region just a couple weeks ago and absolutely want to be involved at the local level and getting data to to the centers, uh, you know, regionally and and individually. It's uh, it's my contest. I can answer some of those questions. So currently in the central region, we have six PCI centers. Three of them are involved in the chest pain MI registry. Three are in the AHA registry. So uh, unfortunately, I think all of them, the surgical sites are all involved at 
DSKI, QI, they've just not signed on to the PCI component. And we've been working on that. That's what would be entailed in pulling the data from chest pain MI into the VCSQI. Uh, the issue why we only have 17 hospitals is, is, is multifactorial, but a lot of it is just delays in getting the AHA hospitals incorporated into the registry. I think most of the data we currently are showing are chest pain MI registries. You know, as, as Peter mentioned earlier, that the big problem we had was we were statewide registry data was collected through a combination of AHA and, a, and AC3, a, ACC through the Mission Lifeline Registry when those two organizations decided to split. Although the registries remained, um, they separated and no longer collate the data together. And that's the, hence the reason for developing this VCSQI registry to try to take those two registries pull all the data together to, pr to provide a statewide registry. One of the limitations you do run into is if you're trying to look at any regional data, there are some specific metrics on the minimum number of hospitals that are allowed to be shown. Uh, AHA, I, I, I believe AHA uses five, ACC uses six. Less than that would allow hospitals to determine both what their hospital was and then figure out what the other hospitals are. So you do need a minimum number of hospitals per region to be able to provide hospital level data on an anonymized level. Excellent, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Anything else before we move on? Very good. Well, thank you again, Dr. O'Brien, and looking forward to building this STEMI database and leveraging the full power of, of VHAC and VCSQI together. Thank Next you. up, we have a summary of our angiographic film review process. In short, this is an updated version. Um, in past years, we've seen some presentations of angiogram film reviews from a different vendor. Uh, this new company is called MacPack, and they are a consortium of uh, PCI appropriateness and quality reviewers from both Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland. They work with the state of Maryland for, for uh, the Maryland's state mandated angiogram reviews. And essentially what this is, is a preemptive, proactive review that we're performing with our VCSQI members to assure appropriateness and make sure that we can provide quality feedback on individual case levels. So this is a set of slides showing preliminary results from MacPack and the reviews uh, that we've seen thus far. So here's a, just a quick overview of the workflow within MacPack and VCSQI where we are selecting uh, elective PCI patients. We're sending over de-identified cath PCI data to MacPack who randomizes the, the films for review, the hospital uploads, MacPack's independent reviewers uh, who are all cardiologists review the films and then provide the data back to VCSQI and our member centers. So these are all for, you know, they're all um, anonymized in terms of the, you know, patient and operator level data and strictly for quality improvement purposes. So we'll show some summaries here. Here's the elements that are reviewed as well. It's a 29 segment model for PCI location. We're reviewing percentage stenosis and especially wanna focus on those patients with less than 50% stenosis um, indicated. We also review for angiographic appropriateness, PCI outcomes, complications, and there are pretty detailed comments that are included in most of the cases as well. Um, we also have the advantage, I'll say just briefly, of tying this back to the cath PCI data. So if we want to do a little bit more assessment kind of between the imaging and um, you know what's indicated in the record, then we can do a deep dive on some of those cases uh, as well. And we've kind of worked on that with a few of the programs who have gone through the reviews thus far. So that's kind of a, a, a brief summary of our MacPack process. Thus far, we have four centers who have participated in 
So we have four centers who have completed their initial reviews, comprising 92 patients and 132 total lesions operated upon. Of those 132, 106 were deemed successful per the film review. So about four fifths of, of lesions were successful. We identified a number of these lesions that were less than or equal to 50%, as I mentioned. So there were six patients comprising seven different lesions. So actually one patient had two lesions less than 50%. It's only about 5% of lesions that fall into that category, uh, but we won't really wanna pay particular focus to those. Uh, the good news is six of those seven were successful, um, which is, you know, that's good, but still we wanna convey that information back to centers in terms of, you know, should that have been done in the first place? Um, and then looking at the overall number of lesions deemed appropriate, appropriate, excuse me, was about 87%. So that's the high level summary of our film reviews. We do have a couple <coughs> trends we can show just based on um, kind of the breakout of cases by category. Here is appropriateness. So again, we had 87% appropriate. The ones that were not appropriate, they were mostly in the quote unquote maybe category and very few, I think just about two patients were rarely appropriate. Next up is the breakdown of complications shown on the films. Uh, the good news is most of them, you know, again, about five, six of the patients, almost seven, eight of the patients had no complications. We saw between five and 10% based on the quarter or rather the, the semi-annual period that had dissection, about 2% with per perforation, a few with side branch occlusion, a few distal embolisms, and maybe one patient with no reflow. Last data slide here shows the breakdown of outcomes. So again, most were deemed successful with less than 10% resi residual stenosis and TIMI-3 flow. Uh, and you can see kind of the breakdown of, you know, kind of partially successful um, to a handful of cases here that were deemed unsuccessful. So th this is again, all patient level information that we are transmitting back to our centers. Uh, so they can kind of look into this more closely to help improve the quality of the uh, PCI interventions that are performed. Sherry, would you like to, to discuss some of the opportunities that this opens up with regards to quality improvement within BCSQI? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Eddie, for turning this over. Over. Um, so this has truly been an enhancement in the angiogram film review process. We feel like we're a partner with MC and MACPAC, and I hope that our centers who participate in the review so far feel the same. Um, after getting feedback, just to find out uh, the you know good and bad about this review, it has not been anything but favorable feedback that has been reported to us. We do note that this data has been used to communicate um, opportunities and presented at quality improvement initiatives. Um, so now we do understand that many of our centers use this data to present at their m and converse, um, conf conferences or quality improvement meetings. Um, these discussions are just showing this review has been found to spark discussion that hasn't, had, hasn't been had and dealt before regarding these angiogram film reviews. We do know this has been an opportunity to celebrate successes because it's broken down by operator. So if there is someone who is performing the reviews or performing angiogram, you know, that's part process um, in a more in-depth, effective way, there has been an opportunity to share those practices with those who may not be performing those um, procedures as effective as others. So there's an opportunity for training and education. And also it's the opportunity to identify behaviors that can be corrected. 
Um, we do hope that we will be able to find more opportunities that these film reviews will pro provide for us going forward to ensure that we are meeting the mission across the state that BCS has in place for our patients. Um, and actually, if we can pause for a second, there's a few members who have participated in these reviews. If you wanted to provide any feedback on your experience um, thus far, as far as participating in this process, please take the moment to uh, share your thoughts. Okay. We will uh, I'll make I'll make a comment if if I might while people gather their thoughts and before they uh, speak up. Um, we have several centers uh, in the queue. Uh, this is something that we really would like other centers to consider participating in. When we started developing this. Uh, was in large part in response to what happened in Maryland that ended up forming their mandated unfunded review. And rather than having the state determine uh, what was going to happen as far as review, we thought this would be a way of being proactive. Um, and so I, we, we find this data very, very interesting because uh, when you fill out your NCDR data, um, you put in whatever percentage stenosis you want. And what they found in Maryland was the fox guarding the hen house, that the person doing the reviewing was not doing the appropriate thing. So uh, we really believe this is an enhancement for our patients, a security for our institutions to be able to have a independent uh, review, random review. We ended up coming up with uh, the 5% of cases based on a 95% null hypothesis uh, in order to pick up, uh, have a likelihood that we would be able to pick up cases where they might have been uh, done inappropriately. All this is intended to do is not as a punitive, but to return the information to the institution so they can look up the uh, cases and uh, do a deeper dive. It may be that uh, fractional flow reserve was done and everything was appropriate, or it may be that they will uncover uh, particular areas of improvement that Sherry um, was commenting on. So uh, this is our updated version because we had issues when we were using ACE before. MedPAC has been fabulous to work with. They're doing it uh, for themselves, so they know what it really uh, what really needs to be done. Uh, so I thank you all for the institutions participating, and hopefully uh, we can have additional institutions uh, participating uh, across our Commonwealth. Hey Sherry, I'll 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 vouch for this or put a plug in for this. This is we're one of the four hospitals, uh, Central Health, um, that is doing this current angiogram review, and honestly, we tried to do this on our own a number of years ago. And, you know, as cath lab director and, and our, you know, invaders in our lab, and it turns out to be very time consuming. And it's also hard to really, you know, objectively grade your partner's cases uh, with all those criteria. I mean, we try our best, but I think it's much better to send your films out, let an objective set of expert eyes look at it, and then give you that data back. Um, our administrators actually had mandated an m and conference for which we had been doing more or less with case reviews. And this, this flows perfectly into our interventional cardi cardiology m and conference. And then last but not least, um, it, you learn stuff. I mean, it's just, it's, it's interesting to get another set of eyes looking at, at your cases, your partner's cases. You really do pick up some interesting tips and some perspectives. So um, again, we're one of the four hospitals. I would really encourage other hospitals for all the reasons I mentioned to, to participate in this great program. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Chair, this is Chris, can you hear me? Absolutely, hi, Chris. Great, hey, uh, we participated in this audit and we were in also in the last two and we absolutely like the way that this was done. We think it was very professionally done. We're much happy with the results. And uh, the only feedback my, guy, my guys gave is 
can't we do more? They want to do more lesions, you know? So they were actually very happy with that uh, information. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chris. And if there's anyone who's interested in participating in these reviews, please send me an email or add in email. Natty, could you go to the next slide, please? I think we have a little ad. Um, you know, just reach out to me, reach out to Eddie. Either one of us will get you set up. There is no additional paperwork that needs to be um, completed. This is included in your current contract for membership for VCSQI, no additional fees. Um, the only kind of work task that will be operationally on the site's end would be the uploading of films. And please remember, in, uh, MacPack is very involved in this aspect. If there's any technical issues that you may be experiencing in the upload process, um, John, the, the coordinator of this project through MacPack has been very involved in making sure that, that your IT department has the abilities and knows how to increase or decrease security so that we can make this as seamless as possible. And once this is done, when you repeat your second round or third round of reviews, it's much, much more seamless. Um, again, again, please reach out to us if you want to participate. We encourage your participation, and I'm pretty sure you will not be um, disappointed with the amount of feedback that are that is received. The the last thing that I would add is if there's value in me as chair of VCSQI uh, and kind of the initiator of this to talk to your cardiologists in your institution, I am happy to do so for those that are wondering whether or not there's value. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Shore. Appreciate you. Thank you so much, Sherry. Thank you everybody who's participated in our film reviews and hopefully uh, we can get more on board soon. So I'm looking forward to the next steps. This brings us to our main presentation for this evening. So. As a start, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. David Wyatt from Carillion. Dr. Wyatt received his medical degree from the University of South Alabama, trained at UVA. He's a member of our VCSQI board of directors, has helped to advise our diversity, equity, and inclusiveness work group, and he's also helped to spearhead this planning committee for tonight's meeting. Uh, Dr. Wyatt will introduce our featured speakers and facilitate the discussion afterwards. So thank you very much for being with us tonight, Dr. Wyatt. Thank you. Thank you all for joining and uh, listening in tonight. We uh, have an interesting discussion. Um, Dr. Tarani is uh, co-chair, co-director of the Interventional Cardiology Lab at uh, ANOVA. Also, he's co-director of the uh, Cardiogenic Shock Program. Uh, Dr. Tang is uh, an adult cardiothoracic surgeon there who has special interest in uh, heart failure and is the uh, director of their CT surgery uh, transplant program. Um, in the ever, ever evolving uh, area of coronary artery vascularization, uh, uh, obviously there are a lot of options, uh, a lot of change in technologies. One of the things that we find or face ourselves uh, with this year is some disagreement perhaps with how some of those different uh, technologies and alternatives should be weighed. Uh, I don't wanna give away too much of the, of, of, of the talk uh, thunder, but uh, basically we're in a situation where the surgical societies and the, and the cardiology societies disagree a little bit on some of the points of, of, uh, of, of those algorithms. So um, I, I'll let it go at that. Uh, our plan is to have um, this talk uh, presented by uh, Drs. Tarani and Tang. Uh, I reviewed their slides. It's a very nice uh, uh, presentation. And then we'll have a uh, question and answer session discussion at the end. Thank you, Dr. Wyatt. Well, Dr. Tarani, Dr. Tang, I will turn it over to you both. And I think, Dr. Tarani, you're going to share your screen. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll share because I have some videos um, that we, we can um, uh, go over together. Let me share my screen here. Can you see my screen? <clears throat> yes, sir. Perfect. Yeah. Great. So thank you uh, very much to Dr. Spear, Dr. White, and the, um, Dr. Shore, Dr. O'Brien, the entire VCSQI for giving Dr. Tang and myself some time to present today and, and with Dr. Spears' uh, insight and leadership as well. 
So uh, we'll first start out with a case. And I think it's always interesting to start out with a case because that gives you a little bit of an insight, if you will, in terms of you know what these patients are in the year 2022 that we're taking care of. So this is a case of an 80-year-old man that we met back at the end of last year, had a known history of coronary disease, had bypass surgery almost 30 years ago with two veins, uh, one vein to his LED and a vein to his right, normal LV function, uh, pretty bad peripheral vascular disease, also had a history of vocal cord cancer and chronic kidney disease, and was seen in our clinic because he was having uh, accelerated angina with si something as simple as walking um, uh, 100 feet. And as you can see here, he's on pretty good cardiac medical uh, cardiac medicines. This was his EKG uh, when he arrived uh, to the clinic. As you can see, it was a relatively quiet EKG, um, you know, maybe an old inferior wall infarct, although really you don't see anything actively ischemic on here. But the patient had pretty profound symptoms of angina brought on with minimal exertion that was relieved with rest. Uh, and so the decision was made to refer him for uh, coronary artery and bypass graft angiography. Um, so as you'll see here, he's got a dist uh, he's got a left main that's got you know very heavily calcified. The distal segment is extended to the osteo circumflex um, and the osteo uh, LAD. And if you recall, you know he had veins to his LAD and to his right did not have a lima graft. Um, as you can see on this other shot here, um, he's got this LAD that wraps around to his apex. The right's totally occluded because you, you see the collaterals. But right here at the bifurcation. Of the um, um, of the mid LED and the diagonal, there's also another hazy calcified lesion. Um, here is uh, the native right. As we saw, it was uh, it was totally occluded. And what I did not mention to you earlier was that he had a, you know he had a vein graft to the right that was also intervened on in the past. And prior to that stent, there he had a very tight uh, napkin uh, ring lesion. So uh, there's a lot of disease. Uh, a, lot, a lot that's progressed over the last several years. And so the decision was made to stop and engage the heart team. So he was seen by the heart team, which consists of our, our cardiac surgeons with Dr. Spear and Tang and colleagues, uh, our, our interventional team. And we do you know, some simple risk stratification. So STS score put this patient around 5%, or almost 20% morbidity and mortality, pretty high syntax, one score. And as you'll see here, because he's elderly, he's a redo bypass patient, syntax two score per PCI and cabbage, right around 30% for four-year mortality. So complex patient, you know, potentially redo bypass, um, pretty complex anatomy in terms of what it would need for PCI, you know, potential atherectomy of the left main, uh, going to uh, the circ and the LAD, complex mid-LAD disease, and he's got, you know, high-grade high lesion in the graft to the right. So as usual, you know, we convene our, uh, our multidisciplinary complex uh, high-risk PCI team. And so you know, we look at a number of factors uh, that in terms of, you know, what could potentially favor cabbage in these patients, anatomic complexity, younger age, normal LV function, good lungs, diabetics, obviously, as we know, what may tip the, you know, tip the scale towards cabbage, you know, uh, anatomic complexity, obviously, but in the setting of frailty and comorbidities um, and, you know, you know, question, you know, regarding long-term prognosis. And then there's obviously the patient, you know, you know, you know what's the patient's healthcare values, goals of care. Um, and really, you know, it brings into, you know, brings into, you know, to bear the, the entire team, the surgeons, the interventionalists, the clinical cardiologists, the other specialists, uh, nurses, our APPs, and the entire multidisciplinary complex high-risk PCI team. And so that's where, you know, we'll talk about, you know, where we are now and what we, where we are in terms of uh, the new ACC AHA revascularization guidelines. So uh, for several decades, cabbage has been the mainstay treatment uh, uh, for complex multivessel disease, especially left main three vessel ischemic cardiomyopathy, because of data showing that there's a survival advantage with cabbage. Uh, many of these trials obviously were conducted before the widespread adop adoption of potent antiplatelet drugs, and before you know we have now these really fabulous heart um, uh, failure medicines, uh, you know beta blockers, ARNIs, SGLT2s, MRAs. But really, there has not been any, any randomized controlled trial. Uh, you know, looking at, at a survival advantage of PCI over optimal medical therapy in these patients. You know, we have registry data from the Impella registries with PROTECT uh, showing that, you know, in the era of more advanced um, tools, IVIS, uh, you know, using um, uh, fractional flow reserve, mechanical circulatory support, that PCI is certainly feasible in these patients and perhaps even complete revascularization is feasible, but that's a, that's a very select patient subset not in the form of you know, randomized controlled trials. So there's still clearly much to be learned. 
And so the question is, you know, in these patients that are high risk and sometimes bordering on prohibitive risk, you know, what is the right answer to managing these patients? Now, we've known for a very long time that cabbage uh, has some benefits over PCI, especially in people with three vessel disease and diabetes, because you're literally bypassing all of these um, uh, potentially future lesions uh, proximal uh, to where um, the anastomosis is. Whereas with PCI, you're, you're, you're alleviating the immediate coronary obstruction, but there are certain patient subsets, diabetics, chronic kidney disease, patients with heart failure, especially if IBIS was not used to ensure adequate stent expansion and size, that there are higher rates of instant resinosis up to 5 to 8% per year. And that's obviously troubling as well. And so, you know, when you look at all of this, we know that the more complex the anatomy is, the higher the risk of morbidity and mortality. But we also know from CTA data that many of these lesions that, you know, have some, that have um, spontaneous plaque rupture and coronary thrombosis, these are more oftentimes from the low to intermediate uh, lesions, which may have thin cap fiber atheromas and, and other uh, features like spotty calcification, attenuation features on CT scan, which my imaging colleagues can speak better to, that increase the risk for a spontaneous MIs. Now, when we talk about coronary revascularization and where we are now, we really have to take a step back and look back and see where we were 30 to 40 years ago, because what we learned then really to this day sometimes informs the management of these patients now. So this was a study from the VA. Again, it was um, almost yeah, it was 40 years ago. It was a randomized controlled trial of cabbage with vein graft versus medical therapy with the treatment of chronic stable angina, 600 patients. And what they showed in these patients was that, in, that the 42 month survival of these patients with left main disease was greater than 50%. Uh, but what they showed was that the, uh, that the benefit was you know, clearly more in the intermediate and the high risk patients and those that underwent surgical revascularization. As you can see, in fact, the survival was two times higher in those in the surgical arm versus the medical arm. Then you uh, fast forward again uh, about a year. Uh, this is another study that, that was published. This is the long-term data from the CAST study. So nearly 25,000 patients stable with ischemic heart disease, of which about 780 of them were randomized to cabbage versus medical therapy, you know, at that time beta blockers and nitrates, class one or class two ends, and relatively young patients by today's standards that you know, at 70% stenosis in one uh, epicardial vessel or more than 50 in the left main, what they showed was there was no difference in the five or the 10 year mortality between those that underwent cabbage or medical therapy. But when you dug under the hood and, um, and you looked deeper, you saw that in those that had low EF and those that had three, D, uh, that, that, that three vessel disease with a you know, moderately reduced EF and those that had left main disease, there was clearly a survival benefit uh, with coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Now, again, five years after that, we had some data that was published from Europe, uh, 768 patients, cabbage versus medical therapy for unstable angina. And again, at that time, medical therapy, beta blockers, nitrates, digitalis, which we don't use that often anymore, and diuretics. And what they showed was that the five-year survival was better with cabbage than medical therapy, and the 10 to 12-year survival was still the same. And those that underwent cabbage with you know, complete revascularization had reduced burden of angina and the need for beta blockers, nitrates. And, and, the, uh, and the associated adjunctive drugs with improved exercise tolerance. Now, uh, go to the mid 90s. Uh, and again, this is more data that was published from the uh, 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 CABBAGE uh, trialist collaboration. And this is a meta analysis of seven randomized controlled trials for stable ischemic heart disease, CABBAGE versus medical therapy, 2,600 patients. And they saw that those that benefited the most from CABBAGE early on and later on were those that had left main disease, three vessel disease, and normal and abnormal LD function with higher burden of angina. Now, we can't really have a conversation around management of complex coronary disease, especially with ischemic cardiomyopathy, unless we really you know, look back at the STITCH trial. Very important study published by Dr. Velasquez and his colleagues from Duke uh, more than 11 years ago, looking at 1,200 patients with low LVEF and coronary disease amenable to cabbage randomized to cabbage plus medical therapy versus optimal medical therapy alone. As you'll see here, um, at around six years, uh, there was really no difference in terms of the death or probability from any cause. But as you dig further, and as you look at more long-term data, clearly there was a benefit for cabbage. But what was interesting was that when they looked at viability, and that's something that we talk a lot now uh, amongst our multidisciplinary heart team, and whether the presence or absence of viability should inform our therapy, they showed that the absence of viability did not identify patients with coronary disease and ischemic LV dysfunction who would benefit from one or the other. So the 
question that was raised. And again, you know, this was, uh, you know, dobutamine stress echoes and spec, uh, not cardiac MR. But the question that was raised is, does viability matter? Should we use viability in these patients? Or is it the, is it the process that, you know, by just bypassing everything, somehow you're going to disperse R waves and viable, you know, viable electrical forces and somehow awaken myocardium that on the surface at least may appear to be dead. Then you fast forward again, five years from that for more extended data, as you'll see here, you start to see a benefit in terms of uh, the endpoints with cabbage. And again, uh, the data with regards to uh, viability is what we just showed you. Now in cabbage with ischemic cardiomyopathy and multivessel disease, in addition uh, to uh, stitch, you know, we also had a lot of uh, very important registries. And as you can see here, cabbage versus PCI, cabbage versus medical therapy, cabbage versus PCI versus medical therapy, looking at some of them very, common endpoints, and again, defines LVEF less than 40% of multivessel disease, more than 16,000 patients. And what they showed was that there was clearly a benefit with cabbage uh, versus medical therapy. But you know, when you looked at cabbage versus PCI, again, uh, uh, there was a, a trend towards favoring uh, outcomes with cabbage. When you look at stroke, again, it was, uh, uh, it was you know, kind of right in the middle because we know there's a high risk of stroke and cabbage in these patients. But when you look at uh, repeat revascularization and MI, there was clearly a benefit with cabbage. This is data that was published by Anna Bortnick and her team eight years ago. One of my partners, Dr. Uh, Kelly Epps, was an also another author on this. And this was data looking uh, from a um, uh, from one of the pair mix data. And what they showed was that over uh, three cohorts of five-year periods of time, 99 to 2004, 2004 to 2009, and then 2006 to 2011, Patients are getting more complex. And we see that in daily practice. They're older, they're living longer because they're meds and we're, and we're treating them. They have more comorbidities and they have more complex uh, coronary artery disease. And so this is where the entire concept of the CHIP team, you know, complex high-risk in interventions come about in which it's the patient in terms of the comorbidities, in terms of what they have, diabetics, you know, previous bypass, valvular heart disease. Many times we have, we have to take into consideration you know, the need for TAVR plus my, uh, a PCI, mitroclip plus PCI. Then, you know, uh, the anatomy, that which we've talked about, and that's where the syntax one score comes in. And we'll talk about how syntax two has changed some of that. And then the equipment. Uh, do we need atherectomy? Do we need more complex tools? Uh, we, now we have the, you know, now we have lithotripsy available. Or I'm sorry, what we call lithoplasty. Is there significant LV dysfunction? Do we have to consider the use of mechanical circulatory support? And this is a paper that Rob Riley and his team put out uh, out of uh, sky two years ago. And so when you look at cabbage versus PCI in patients with multivessel disease, the data thus far has suggested, that, again, based on the contemporary tools that were available at the time these studies were published, that there's better long-term results uh, with cabbage. Now, this is a registry that was published out of Alberta. Uh, it, was, it was the approach registry, more than 11,000 patients over five-year period of time. Cabbage and PCI did better than medical therapy. So you you offer the patient revascularization, they did better. And those that especially had, had left main disease or low LV function did even were the ones that did the best. Uh, Syntax 1 was published by Peter Seroy and his team uh, more than 12 years ago. Uh, 1,800 patients uh, that, that three vessel disease or left main randomized one to one. So at that time, um, it, was a, it was a taxis drug gluing stents which were available or cabbage. And as you'll see here, the low, uh, the low syntax scores. You, know, you see equipoise, but as you start to go to the intermediate and the more high risk ones, there was a benefit with cabbage. And the question is, why is that? Many of them had chronic total occlusions. And as we know, um, you know, sometimes, you know, um, some lesions are more difficult to intervene on uh, percutaneously. And that's where the benefit of surgery comes in, where our colleagues are able to revascularize as much, if not all uh, of the diseased vessels as possible. And so, um, but again, even we know from the syntax study that, you know, a third of patients with chronic total occlusions, a third of patients with some more complex coronary anatomy did not undergo complete revast. And those were the ones that actually had worse outcomes compared to those that underwent complete revascularization surgically. Syntax, again, uh, you know, this is a very important study that took into consideration a number of factors, the number of the disease vessels, tortuosity, bifurcation, chronic total occlusions, trifurcation, uh, thrombus burden, and it put into a score in which there were zero to 22, whether they were low, 23 to 32 intermediate, or more than 30, or 33 and higher, which they were high risk. And again, as you'll see here, short-term and long-term five-year data showed that in the five, in the uh, in the intermediate, especially in the high-risk arms, there was a benefit with cabbage over PCI. 
Now, just as we can't talk about you know this field without talking about um, uh, the stitch study, we, we also can't talk about it without you know discussing the courage study, which was one of the first uh, important studies looking at uh, revascularization and the merits of revascularization patients with stable ischemic heart disease. And uh, Bill Bowden and his team uh, showed that in these patients, when they were randomized, so there was 70% stenosis and they had angina with, uh, I'm sorry, 70% stenosis and uh, is one epicardial lesion, or they were 80% and, and they, were, they had some signs of uh, uh, provocative ischemia. When they looked at PCI versus, and medical therapy versus optimal medical therapy alone, they did not see a difference in terms of survival free from death from any cause in MI. And so that's where the question was raised is are we offering the patients any particular benefit? Now you fast forward now to just uh, two years ago, this is actually published. It was actually shown at the 2019 AHA meeting and then published uh, in early 2020, which was the ischemia study. And this looked at patients uh, with demonstrable ischemia, but asymptomatic to an initial invasive approach uh, versus optimal medical, uh, uh, with optimal medical therapy versus uh, optimal medical therapy alone. And when they looked at the primary outcome of death from cardiovascular cause, MI, or hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, or resuscitation from cardiac arrest, that there was no benefit with regard to those endpoints uh, with revascularization compared to uh, medical therapy, but they did show that you can actually reduce anginal burden. And this study was very important. And this study, as we'll talk about, you know, informed some of the um, recommendations that were made by the uh, 2021 um, writing group. So in you know, 2017, you know, we had the appropriateness use criteria that was published again, looking at you know, what's considered appropriate, maybe appropriate or, or, um, or inappropriate. And what these uh, documents at that time showed was that you had to have demonstrated some level of failure of a medical therapy, one or at least two, at least one and if not two anti antianginal drugs. And in these patients, uh, if you had demonstrated a failure of medical therapy and, and demonstrated ischemia, in these patients, then obviously revascularization was more likely to be considered appropriate. And so the question then comes is, what about these patients that are not surgical candidates? What do we know uh, about them? And we, there's a lot that we don't know. This was a nice paper that was published uh, just a year ago, looking at the role of PCI in multivessel disease with ischemic cardiomyopathy. And as you can see here, whether it's the acute phase or the chronic phase, there's a lot that we don't know. We don't know much in terms of uh, the use of um, uh, low wire assistance for physiologic guidance. We have good data now with regard to IBIS and, and how using that can reduce the, you know, um, the risk for other adverse cardiovascular events down the road. But when you look at these patients, especially the ones that are acute heart failure or the ones that are bordering on shock, so there's a lot that we don't know. Obviously, we have PROTECT4, that's just, which is ongoing, and that's going to hopefully inform our, um, sort of our understanding in terms of whether percutaneous VADs with Impella may be a benefit. We have data from... Uh, Great Britain, that's, you know, that's currently ongoing with the revived BCSI2. And then we have some data with regards to danger and uh, dangerous shock, ECLS shock and Euroshock, uh, looking at the, at the shock patients that are coming in with acute MIs. But in general, in the era of current uh, adjunctive tools in PCI and ischemic cardiomyopathy, there's a lot more question marks than there are answers. And so this was a nice paper that was published out of Toronto uh, just about a year ago. And again, observational registry, and we can take these observational registry data for what they are, which is, you know, there's always a grain of salt, patient selection, um, you know, you know uh, those that are brought in, survival biases. And again, they showed that there was benefit with cabbage versus PCI in, in patients with three vessel disease and ischemic cardiomyopathy. And uh, PCI in patients with uh, multivessel disease and diabetes, this, uh, you know, data, a lot of it was informed from what we learned initially in, in the 80s with the studies that I showed you, but again, from the FREEDOM trial that was published um, more than 10 years ago. That there was a benefit with cabbage uh, versus PCI. And so now in the era of contemporary revascularization, what do we do? So we now have obviously good risk stratification tools. You know, you know we showed you the STS calculator and some, and some may question whether that may sometimes underestimate risk in these patients because there's some underlying level of frailty, which is really salient and it's kind of under the hood. We have the multidisciplinary heart team. We have good data from intravascular imaging studies. I, IVIS XPL for long lesions, 28 millimeters, Ultimate, which was also published. We have good data from uh, with regard to coronary physiology. FAME 3 was just published at the end of last year, which showed that FFR guided PCI was uh, not non inferior uh, to cabbage. And then we also have data with regard to complete revascularization from, from observational studies that suggest 
if we can offer complete revascularization using these optimal tools, then maybe we can achieve equipoise versus with PCI versus cabbage. But again, observational data that requires further informing um, of that knowledge with randomized controlled trials. And so Syntax 2 came along, and again, this was uh, about five years ago. So eight years after the initial Syntax study, multi-center, all-comer, um, open label, looking at the impact of contemporary strategies, the heart team, as well as these adjunctive tools. So the heart team approach, looking at anatomic clinical factors, physiologic guidance, IVIS, using thin struts, using uh, um, you know, contemporary techniques to facilitate complete revascularization for CTO and GDMT. And when they looked at the outcome of MACE, so composite all-cause death, CVA, uh, MI, and any revascularization at one year, uh, compared to the predefined court from the, from the Syntax 1 study, they showed that at four years, there was equipoise between these two methods of coronary revascularization. So you take these complex patients, you risk stratify them, you use all the appropriate adjunctive tools that are available to you. And perhaps uh, in you know, certain subsets of patients, you can achieve equipoise uh, with uh, a cabbage if you're using uh, percutaneous revascularization techniques. And again, this was, uh, these are the curves for the out, uh, outcomes. And I showed you there was equipoise. And so on the back of all of this data, and the most recent one being the, the ischemia trial, this is where we had uh, you know, the, the uh, 2021 writing group uh, you know, put this data together. So the recommendation was for better or for worse, and you know, we all think it's for the better, in these patients that are undergoing evaluation, it's a class one level evidence recommendation to get the heart team involved. So interventional cardiology, cardiac surgery, clinical cardiology, imaging, anesthesia, the you know, obviously multidisciplinary APP teams, um, you know, other specialists involved in the care of these patients, take into consideration anatomy, comorbidities, procedural factors, and patient factors, and look at it not only from the aspect of the pre and the periprocedural portion of managing these patients, but also post. You know, if they're going to have a difficult time, if they, they can get pristine results in the OR, beautiful bypass grafts, if they have a hard time, you know, recovering and they require trach and the LTAX, our surgical colleagues can tell you that those patients don't do very well long term. Then they looked at patients that are being considered for cabbage. Again, using the STS score can be helpful, class one. In patients that have multivessel disease and you're assessing complexity, the syntax score is obviously very helpful. They also recommended taking into consideration aspects of frailty. And that uh, not, is not only a multi, not only organ system frailty, so cirrhosis, uh, history of stroke, dementia, but also nutrition and also their gait, because that obviously certainly plays a role with regard to their recovery. And so, what they had mentioned was that patients with stable ischemic heart disease and multivessel disease, appropriate for cabbage, with severe LV dysfunction defined less than 35%, class one cabbage is the recommended approach to go. In those with stable ischemic heart disease and multivessel disease, um, with mild to moderate LV dysfunction, you have 35 to 50%, cabbage is reasonable, so class 2A. Left main disease and significant, significant left main disease, 50% or more, and with a uh, uh, physiologic guidance and with an, usually with an MLA of less than six and a half millimeters squared, cabbage is the way to go. And in those in, in that PCI can provide, you know, equivalent revascularization outcomes, then in those patients, you know, a, a PCI was given a class 2A. Interestingly, when you look at this and you go further along, one of the things that they have said as a class three at the very bottom, as you'll see, is that if you can't demonstrate ischemia, especially with flow wire in the cath lab, and that's been, you know, adjudicated with a non-invasive imaging modalities, there's no benefit. And we all know that, that, that in the absence of demonstrable ischemia, especially with asymptomatic patients, there's no benefit to revascularization. In patients with, uh, with angina, but no anatomic or physiologic criteria for revascularization, neither cabbage nor PCI should be recommended. Patients with refractory angina, despite medical therapy with significant coronary disease, obviously revascularization is recommended. Uh, and in patients that, uh, who require revascularization for multivessel disease and complex disease, they find the syntax score greater than 33. Interestingly, they said it was a 2A to, to choose cabbage over PCI with regard to a survival advantage. 2A recommendation, patients with diabetes of multivessel disease amenable to PCI and an indication to undergo revascularization. PCI may be uh, a, um, a useful alternative to cabbage. So as you can see here, you know, they, they looked at these patients and if they had left main disease and, and it was suitable for cabbage, cabbage is one. And, uh, and obviously that takes into consideration the, multi, uh, the multidisciplinary heart team. If there's no left main disease and there's underlying ischemic cardiomyopathy and these patients are favorable to undergo cabbage, especially with EF more than 50%, then cabbage is the way to go. 
And in those that have suitable anatomy for cabbage and their appropriate candidates, cabbage is a class one. And if it's 35 to 50%, interestingly, cabbage was a class 2A. And so um, I will open this up to Drs. Uh, Spear and Tang, but these are some of the points of concern that our surgical colleagues from the uh, STS and the ATS um, had uh, put forth. One was the downgrade of cabbage from 1 to 2B, patients with three vessel disease, normal LV function, compared to medical therapy. Second was downgrade of cabbage from class 1 to 2A for cabbage to improve survival in patients with three vessel disease and mild to moderate LV dysfunction, defined as 35 to 50%. Three was a lack of recognition of long-term benefits of cabbage versus PCI in reducing the need for um, repeat revascularization and obviously post-procedural MI. And interestingly, the other was the class one evidence uh, the recommendation for using the radial artery as a cabbage conduit. So this is just a very brief discussion. I know Dr. Spear and Tang will go into it in more detail and I'll be happy to open up to my surgical colleagues. I'll stop sharing now. Um, let's see here. Oh, I'm sharing. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Dr. Tang, we, excuse me, I'm sorry. We see your screen up. Just unmute and we'll be able to hear you. Thanks. <laughs> Great. All right. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, Benham very nicely uh, summarized uh, the, uh, uh, the the data to date, as well as um, the current uh, changes and guidelines. And, um there was a lot of controversy um, between uh, with the uh, surgical societies, even to the degree that uh, both the uh, STS and the AATS uh, actually withdrew uh, their endorsements uh, for the new guidelines. Um, and uh, just to uh, summarize briefly, um, uh, Dr. Spear very kindly uh, uh, wrote up a summary uh, for this. Um, the uh, um, as Ben mentioned, the primary concerns with the current guidelines was. Um, this downgrading of what was previously considered a class one recommendation for bypass surgery and treatment of multivessel coronary disease. Um, this, uh, the, the changes in sort of the uh, implications of, of benefits of cabbage over PCI. And then as well as uh, and a side note, uh, the, the uh, elevating uh, the use of radial condoms to a class one uh, recommendation. And so um, uh, in particular, you know, in that backslide where uh, multivessel coronary disease with normal systolic function, uh, it got downgraded to a, from a strong recommendation uh, to a weak recommendation um, in that uh, cabbage was considered reasonable but not necessarily recommended. Um, and this is a two level decrease in the recommendation uh, for surgery. And this was uh, strongly based off of the recent ischemia trial, which Benham summarized. And um, there are a couple of significant uh, limitations uh, to, you know, that uh, were worth pointing out with the ischemia trial, um, in particular with it, you know, to the point where it's uh, leading to such a marked change in, in the guideline recommendations. So number one, uh, in the ischemia uh, results, it was a short uh, follow-up uh, period of uh, three years. Um, and you really need um, five to 10 year outcome data to show uh, in, in uh, all those trials that, that uh, Benham had su nicely summarized, uh, some of the uh, benefits uh, that would be seen. Uh, in particular, you know, the ischemia trial was, was uh, not uh, primarily intended to uh, evaluate uh, bypass versus PCI. It was looking at the uh, group that got initial invasive strategy. Only a quarter uh, received uh, uh, bypass surgery, about 26%, I think. Um, and then um, if you, uh, versus uh, PCI. And then more importantly, if you look at even in the, some of the crossovers versus the intent to treat in the conservative group uh, about uh, the 20% uh, actually did uh, receive PCI, sorry about that. Um, as well as, well as in the uh, invasive group, 
about the same numbers uh, received cabbage. And so they're comparing, you know, in terms of, you know, talking about invasive versus not invasive, there was a fairly significant amount of crossover in, in the attempt uh, to treat groups. Um, there was concerns um, that um, given the, the amount of diabetes and the amount of uh, multivessel disease uh, with the current guidelines at the time that there may have been, you know, underutilization of bypass surgery uh, as well. Um, the uh, patients uh, that um, en enrolled in uh, the ischemia or thirst, you know, not uh, particularly represented. In fact, less than 50% of the patients had LAD disease, um, which uh, we would know that uh, mortality would be low with or without intervention uh, at five years. Um, so I think in particular, you know, using just the uh, uh, data from the ischemia trial to make such a big change in the guideline, um, particularly in light of the large amount of data to date from the multiple other trials, multiple other meta-analyses of all these uh, patients um, uh, put together, uh, downgrading the, the, low, uh, the recommendations for consideration for bypass surgery in these patients with uh, multivessel disease and normal function um, was uh, the uh, major uh, concern uh, from the group. And again, just uh, re-emphasizing, it's, it's not particularly surprising uh, in, a, in a more short-term uh, study um, that the observed value of bypass over medical therapy and a uh, more than this uh, stable ischemic heart disease patients um, that, uh, that this was not uh, a big surprise. Um, finally, um, talking about uh, the radial arteries as a conduit, um, you know, you know, similarly, there is a lot of data to support the use and the benefit uh, use of arterial grafting, uh, but um, there seemed to be a little bit of an overemphasis um, and a marked change from what is a uh, common widespread uh, considered standard of care practice across the country and to uh, abruptly uh, elevate it to a uh, class one recommendation uh, with the implication that you're somehow not doing the right thing if you're not uh, making use of it um, was not considered justified. Um, so um, in terms of uh, you know, as such a departure from what is considered the current standard of care, um, the, you know, elevating the use of a radial artery to a class one recommendation um, really um, uh, should not be. I think the, the benefits of the data that to date are, are rel relatively remarkable. And um, the society as a whole felt that it justified an elevation to a class 2A recommendation, uh, but not to a level one recommendation. And so finally, in summary, based off of all these uh, differences, um, the societies felt uh, ultimately compelled them to uh, uh, withdraw their support uh, for these uh, new guidelines. Um, so that is the summary of the uh, surgical uh, societal opinions of these guidelines. Just as a, you know, as a personal practice, though, just talking about how you know, even going back to the patient that uh, Benham originally presented, it is, um, uh, I think, uh, you know, both he and I would suggest that it is very much uh, incumbent on the, on the teams with, you know, sort of less clarity in the uh, guidelines in terms of uh, what to discuss and, and recommend to patients. Uh, the notion of having a collaborative, very much like this current society of the VHAC and, and the VCSQI, of having a collaborative interaction between uh, the different uh, specialties discussing, you know, what is uh, ultimately, you know, the best plan and the best outcome for the patients. Uh, thanks. Uh, this is uh, uh, David Wyatt. Thank you very much. That was a great summary. I, I was uh, had the fortune of seeing most of those slides earlier and thought they were, they were a good representation of the data. And I've really appreciated all, all the points made at the end by Dr. Tang. Uh, w one other thing I'd like to add that that uh, a lot of our society membership also had uh, pointed out is that uh, part of the reason some of the older surgery data, uh, older data was um, not used or disregarded is because of the uh, uh, consideration that 
that uh, the field of interventional cardiology has improved a lot and that data may not be relevant now, but I think we would also counter that, that outcomes from cardiac surgery has improved as well. Um, when I finished training, basically you quoted a 3% mortality risk in, in cabbage and now we're usually quoting around a 1% and there's even been uh, some pretty, you know, recent data where, you know, experienced large groups can can even have a mortality rate less than 1% in, in, in their routine uh, cabbage practice. So uh, obviously there's some controversy there. Um, uh, I think there's opportunity there. One of the things that I think um, across the board uh, that I've, that's been said is that, you know, we just need to talk about our patients. It needs to be multidisciplinary and it needs to be sort of center focused. I, I know that um, I'd like to start with one question for, for the, um, uh, uh, for that ANOVA group is that you've talked a lot and even uh, made reference to your heart team. Uh, I know that uh, that's been a concept that's been around for a while. I'm not sure it's been instituted that well in a lot of places. I know at, at, at Carillion, I wouldn't say we really function as with a heart team. We're um, uh, that well, uh, but would like to hear your comments about how how you see that working, how it obviously it's, it, you can't get that group together to discuss every patient and kind of what, what your process is for uh, for for the heart team, how it works, how patients come through particular patients is a little more acute. Yeah, so um, great question. I'll, I'll, if it's okay with Dan, I'll start a little bit and I'll let Dan obviously fill in from the surgical perspective. So if these patients are coming in and they have, they're more stable and they have complex multivessel disease, low EF, comorbidities, we say just stop. Take the patient off the table, uh, you know, engage the team. And the team is consists of obviously the surgical uh, uh, the surgeons, the interventionalist, the referring clinical cardiologist. Uh, we have obviously our APP service, and we and you know we have monthly what's called chip chip meetings, and these are usually the third Monday of the month. And many times, if the patient's outside that time period uh, and it's more time sensitive, then we'll just you know adjourn a more um, more ad hoc meeting via Zoom. Well, you know we have our APPs obviously go in and, and see the patients and you know and, and help us you know understand some of the salient points. And we'll, and we'll present the patient. We'll discuss the options. We'll talk, go over, you know, goals of care, code status, uh, you know, you know, you know, potential need for support, whether it's you know, ECMO with cabbage, whether it's uh, you know, PCI with Impella, or you know, PCI sometimes with ECMO, and we'll, and then we'll, and then you know, we'll make a decision. And so, if they meet two out of three buckets, so you know, the three buckets are anatomic complexity, the other is comorbidities, and the other is, you know, the need for, you know, potential uh, support. I mean, two out of those, by definition, they're considered complex. And then we'll, you know, we'll convene and we'll discuss. And so, uh, you know, and at the end, you know, we'll take that back to the patient and their surrogates. And if it's in line with their goals of care and we feel we can offer this to them with good results with minimal risk, um, then, you know, we'll, then, you know, we can do that. But really, this in these patients, they oftentimes fall in that gray zone. There really is no one right answer. So this one patient that we just showed you, you know, ultimately we agreed that, you know, redo bypass was the right approach. And Dan took him to the OR, got a very nice result. Um, you know, and the patient is obviously still recovering, but we felt that that was going to be the best long-term uh, result. Diabetic with, you know, multivessel disease, give them arterial conduits and give them best long-term uh, durability. So that's how we do it. Obviously, I'll let Dan provide some expertise from his perspective. I mean, I think from my perspective, ultimately it's kind of, you know, how do the guidelines inform your practice, right? I think, um, at least from a, a surgeon's perspective, you know, what, what, you know, I mean, we see a wide variety of, uh, I mean, there's going to be heterogeneity in how different, you know, interventionalists will, will look at a cath and how they'll refer, you know, what patients they'll refer to you and so forth. But I think one of the biggest strengths of a sort of a formalized program of both, whether it's the shock calls, the conference, the cath conferences, the chip calls or so forth, is this constant communication as well as this constant reevaluation and sort of QI of, you know, was this appropriate, you know, or, or otherwise for, for, for whatever uh, intervention got, that got decided. I think, unfortunately, you know, in terms of, you know, you know, this, I think a lot of the fear is that, you know, some of these dramatic changes in the guidelines, you know, may then ultimately end up with, you know, changes in, 
whether it's recommendations to health policy, insurance, you know, you know, authorizations and those sorts of things. But I think in terms of just from a clinical decision making, um, there's, I think there's no doubt these days that um, the options for treating patients have become, you know, quite wide in terms of varied um, in terms of, uh, and our ability to treat, you know, uh, sicker, you know, uh, more complex patients of whether by surgery or by PCI is also expanded and trying to select the right decision does require, a, you know, an interdisciplinary approach. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Spear, would you, would you mind commenting on uh, kind of your take on, on these changes and uh, the process at ANOVA? It, obviously, it, it, it sounds like it's something that we could all aspire to be able to achieve. Uh, would love to hear your comments. Thank you, David. And uh, let me just compliment Benham and um, Dan for their uh, overview and uh, their expansive sort of view on what has uh, evolved. I would also like to uh, invite Dr. Kathleen Petro, the head of our revascularization arm in our practice to comment if she, uh, if, if and when I miss something here. I think to, uh, we've heard a lot of data and for those that don't live and breathe this every day uh, as our interventional cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, uh, it can be a lot to get your hands on. And so what was really the intent? What was the purpose of presenting this this evening? And to put it in a little context, for the past uh, two decades, our cardiovascular societies uh, with the Society of Thoracic Surgery and American Association for Thoracic Surgery, uh, the one hand, and then our ACC, the American Heart Association and Sky on the other, have been able to collaborate through a, a very circuitous course with the evolution of goal-directed medical therapy and uh, the advances, uh, uh, significant advances in PCI, as well as in cardiac surgical intervention for ischemic heart disease, to have to build consensus despite some of the disagreements on the appropriateness of these guidelines, as Dan alluded to, that gave us sort of the fabric and backbone rather than the disparate individual approaches uh, we could have consensus to how we're approaching this population of patients. And so this was a major break in that historical perspective. Um, and I should point out that it was not only the STS and the ATS, but over the subsequent uh, months in the first part of the year after these guidelines had been uh, published, the uh, EACS, the uh, European Cardiothoracic Surgical Society, as well as the European Cardiology Society, the uh, Asian uh, Cardiac Sur Surgical Societies in both Japan and in China, as well as the South American Cardiac Societies also withdrew support in, uh, on these guidelines. And uh, so this was not a, uh, just a small uh, change. And uh, this is one of the reasons we wanted to present it this evening, just to show you sort of what has transpired, what were the reasons for it. And I think Dan reviewed uh, the editorial that I would commend to you from the April, uh, both the American Association, the Journal of, of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery, as well as the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. And if you bring up that other slide, it gives you that reference. And uh, Joe Sabic, uh, and there uh, was uh, who was the secretary of the STS, was also the single uh, appointee uh, to the writing committee from the STS by design. Uh, they, there was another from the AATS, and so there were two uh, distractors. One was process related that we don't need to get into because it's it's pretty contentious and is in the process of being resolved. And then the other is the clinical differences that Dan uh, reviewed. So the uh, two, two level decrease uh, that was solely uh, given to the ischemia trial and the reservations that it has, both uh, for the length of follow-up at 3.2 years rather than the five to 10 year that historically is shown through a multitude of um, reports is showing the differences in catheter-based intervention as well as uh, surgical, uh, then as opposed to surgical intervention. The focus, uh, the, the failure to focus on uh, repeat in, uh, interventions and the lowered rate from surgery as well as the 
uh, downstream morbidities with MI uh, that, uh, as opposed to incomplete revascularization uh, from PCI, which are all very well known. And then sort of uh, the, the radial artery, which is an excellent conduit, but is uh, given a lot more weight than, than was felt to be appropriate. So that's what the withdrawal of the surgical societies was predicated upon. Well, what do we do with that information? And so we used uh, this forum uh, where Benham presented uh, to our uh, cardiology uh, a monthly uh, group meeting that's well represented from, from our interventional cardiologists and surgeons. And then we presented them the editorial rebut to, to open the forum and say, okay, how's, what do we do with this data? How, where, how do we go forth? Is this going to open the doors widely open? And do we take a big step backward, uh, both for goal-directed therapies or for a more aggressive approach that we lived through in the uh, uh, last, uh, I guess, uh, 10 years ago with triple vessel intervention, particularly uh, in those with, with moderate to severe LV dysfunction and diabetics? Or do we stay the course from our institution and continue to collaborate? Uh, and David brought up about uh, uh, the communication with our cardiologists and surgeons on these, on these patients. When there are questions, what do we do with that? And uh, can we continue to be guided as we historically have been? So it was such a positive uh, discussion and not everybody agreed, of course, nobody ever agreed uh, totally, but uh, to, to bring this to this group, this uh, statewide collaborative and open that up with all of you to then say, okay, there's been a, a, a different shift here. Uh, there's there's different consensus with two level decreases in the appropriateness uh, for revascularization of the open with bypass surgery, as opposed to what the guidelines showed before. What are we gonna do with this? And what in your institution should you do with it? Uh, if anything. Um, so I hope we've been able to give you the overview uh, over these last 15 years from the, the literature point out the uh, shortcomings for the ischemia trial, which was the cornerstone of the changing guidelines, why the surgeons almost worldwide withdrew from those guidelines, and then what will we do in the future? Because I can tell you, it won't be business as usual. The societies are meeting. There's a very active discussion about how to, the composition of the writing committee, how that will change, because these consensus was uh, gained by simple majority. Uh, and simple vote. It was not at parity. There was a lot more cardiologists and, and surgeons. And, and again, it's uh, good people can disagree. So we wanted to bring it to you, open it up to you, uh, give a chance for everybody to know what, what transpired, uh, particularly for the non-interventional cardiologist. What do you do with this information? Uh, does this change how you treat the patients when you refer them? and uh, just open this up to all of you. Uh, so I'm sorry I, I was so long-winded, but that was the rationale between where we were and where we are and how we got there. Thank you very much for uh, that summary. And I would, again, I congratulate the Nova Group for uh, talking about it, uh, for the work that you've done and your willingness to bring it to uh, this group. It's very, very impressive and very welcome. And uh, I thank you. Um, so I, I think it's reasonable to open the question, uh, open questions up to the uh, panel. I'd love to, uh, to uh, get some more uh, input from any of the other surgeons on board or cardiologists or, and, and non -inter both interventional and non-interventional cardiologists that might have any comments or, or, or questions for the presenters. Uh, this is Bob Shore. I'm a reformed interventionalist. I'm a former interventionist who's out of the lab. Um, I, I would say that within, th there are some straightforward cases um, that it makes a huge amount of sense to do one thing or the other. And in that gray area, which is also fairly apparent that creating that heart care team is very important. If you are in a larger practice, then I think it behooves you to have the conversation amongst the general cardiologists and the interventionalists 
with regard to uh, general approaches to these understanding that there is sharp disagreement in some of the changes in the guidelines. So you're prepared beforehand with the process. I'd be interested for other cardiologists in, in different kinds of settings, how they uh, handle the discussion of PCI versus surgery, whether or not there are heart teams, um, whether they, what their thoughts are about the guidelines, understanding some of the confusion uh, about the guidelines as well. We've either overwhelmed them with data or totally bewildered them. <laughs> I think this is an amazingly well presented and can often be confusing um, topic. And I think having that shared decision making and conversation with the heart team you know, is the critical point. I, I will comment uh, at, at Carillion, while we don't have a formal heart team, I mean, we have a good relationship with our cardiologist, and, and I'm not sure that I've seen our referral patterns change that much as a result of this. Of course, if we're not seeing the patient, you don't, or we're not talking about the patient, you don't know that the patient's not coming to you, but we still, we still get a lot of referrals for, for, uh, for triple vessel disease, and sometimes they're not necessarily even that complex. Um, is a, and we, we actually get referred a lot of patients that we wish we had some conversation beforehand because there are patients that we would never really want to operate on. So it's like, um, you know, I, I, I think that the, the whole concept of, of having uh, more conversation about these patients up front certainly, um, uh, certainly is a, a, a reasonable thing. I've got one, spe one specific question uh, that was brought during the slide, and that's the from the STITCH trial about the, the study showing uh, um, perhaps um, the lack of usefulness of using viability as part of your decision making. And I wanted to find out specifically uh, what your group does there. If, if you have someone that comes in that's got a, a ischemic cardiomyopathy and they've got a patent but disease right and cert and they're They've got EKG that's got showed that they've had an anterior MI and their LEDs occluded. Um, do you, what do you do with that patient? Do you operate on them? Do you not operate on them? Do you do a viability? Uh, could could some someone comment on that? Well, as you know, Stitch was primarily dobutamine stress echo and SPECT, um, and not cardiac MR. And, and there's certainly a lot of good stuff coming with cardiac MR in terms of looking at delayed enhancement and getting an understanding of that. You know, we have some really excellent. Um, uh, uh, cardiac radio, uh, cardiac, and then also radiologic imaging experts we have at our institution that have really good expertise with MR. Um, obviously, I'm going to let Dr. Spear and Tang weigh in here, but we still use it and discuss it and, and see how that can inform management because um, you know the absence of viability in, 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 the, um, in a large territory of myocardium, and, and you know, same this patient for a single vessel bypass, the right or the circ or maybe perhaps a better discussion should be around heart failure therapies and destination heart failure therapies if they're a candidate for it can you know can change that conversation yeah i mean i think that's like i think you know back when the stitch trial you know that subgroup was originally published about the viability study it was interesting it seemed like there was almost a there a larger improvement with surgery in the non-viable group and and it, it ultimately came down to that the that, you know, it's a question of, you know, how sensitive and specific is the test, right? Um, and nuclear viability and, and debutamine stress is not going to be as sensitive as or, or clear about showing, you know, non-recoverable myocardium as, as MR. And so in terms of like, how does that, I think the, the conversation becomes even more complicated because of, of, you know, at the time of the stitch trial is revascularization versus, um, you know, surgical, you know, ventricular restoration. But I think with, you know, particularly with uh, within a, the advanced heart failure 
the explosion in the use of, of durable mechanical circulatory support, as well as with, you know, uh, even just uh, uh, the growth of, of using heart transplants as well, um, that plays a major role too in terms of what it really is the best thing. If, if you just manage to get, you know, limp somebody with essentially a dead heart through a multivessel bypass, but within a year they're, in, you know, outright, you know, florid heart failure dependent on inotropes, have you really done that, that person any favors? And trying to select out those patients versus the patients that have, you know, severe uh, ischemic disease and that end up having improved function after revascularization, bypass for stents or otherwise, is, is actually, I think, a very difficult thing to do. Um, in general, what we've done here is, is we look at other surrogates. We look at MR as, a, as hopefully a more sensitive mechanism for looking at viability. But then other surrogates, if you have a big blown out dilated heart, that heart is much less likely to have significant recovery of function. If you have you know, significant other vascular problems, if you have just a heart valvular uh, disease, I meant to say, or if you just simply have uh, a patient with um, just the bare you know, bones in terms of uh, tolerance for something like a cabbage, I think sometimes one of the sort of uh, uh, intermediate uh, therapeutic options, if, if really bypass surgery is thought to be the best option for them, is to do bypass surgery in addition to a durable uh, device. Uh, because in those patients, a lot of times that durable device can be uh, deactivated in sort of a very uh, minimally invasive sort of fashion uh, versus um, a lot of sometimes those patients do go on to, to, to make use of that device in a long-term fashion. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we we use viability a fair amount, and I mean, I think if we don't feel like we can put a lima to a good uh, lima, uh, lima to a good LED territory, we tend to, uh, you know, probably not want to operate on them. Uh, Doctor Berzingi is one of our interventional cardiologists at um, uh, Karelian, and he had uh, uh, ha had a comment to make. Doctor Berzingi. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Wyatt, and thank you very much, Dr. Tarani and Dr. Tan, for an excellent, excellent overview of a very complex um, clinical scenario that you all face on a regular basis in our daily um, practice. Uh, one thing that I find it uh, very challenging, uh, guidelines are guidelines, and we are trying to make national and international societal uh, agreements on diseases that sometimes appears to me very regional and uh, locality based uh, depending on the practices. And to connect what has been discussed to this forum from VCSQI, I wonder if that tells us, uh, enhances the role of um, VCSQI and what they are looking for to be able to look into our individualized data from our own patients, from our own institutions and in our own re region to see what the data suggests in terms of outcomes with surgery in terms of outcomes with PCI, the challenges that we face with PCI, the challenges that we face with surgery, that takes into consideration our patient's demography, follow-ups, compliance, medical therapy, surgical therapy. And um, to kind of conclude it and connect it again, I think that might, in my mind, that tells us that maybe we should be probably more thorough with our reporting and uh, regional and uh, locality-based databases that are more inclusive to almost all of our patients to make more conclusive um, decisions rather than having <coughs> decisions they based on ischemia trial and number of patients in certain area and then we try to globalize it or regionalize it na nationwide. That's a great point. I think uh, it's like everything else. We've got uh, how many, Eddie? Now, 150,000 patients in our database, and and uh, with the volume of uh, uh, coronary bypass procedures for over 20 years, and so that it's a matter of the time, effort, and energy to analyze that data. And you know, everyone's welcome to ask these questions. We have a research and writing group, and we can uh, certainly begin to put that together, but it's like everything else. We get back in our own worlds and these questions become theoretical, but the, the data is there and it can be analyzed. The one thing I will refer you to, Mike, Mike Brown asked an interesting question. Have we seen a decline in bypass across the Commonwealth 
since these recommendations have been published and Eddie responded that actually, no, it's almost exactly the same in the fourth quarter of 21 and the first quarter of 22. But the, the real issue, and that's one of the secondary reasons for presenting it tonight is how do we learn? And it's assumed that because something's published that people will know about it, but actually in our, you know, how many of us actually read the journals every month? Uh, and we know historically it's about only 30% of, of surgeons, at least I can't speak for cardiologists that the data transfer is through our, our, uh, societal, uh, trade journals. You know, there's another 30% that is, uh, internet searches and personal communications. And then, uh, so it's, it's variable how people learn and how they're educated. And so, um, uh, you know, hopefully this will be a first start in asking some of these questions. That's why we try to, on a quarterly basis, get timely and, multi and multidisciplinary collaborative things to, that are data researched and supported by our own VCSQI data to try to give these examples. But there's a lot of information that's just overwhelming out there, and it's hard to keep up. Well, I think I think the point can be made again. I think more more conversation, uh, more multidisciplinary approaches. These things are will always be positive. Uh, secondly, regard you know we'd like to get the answer right. Um, there, there's <laughs> it's hard to be right uh, about a lot of things, and it is a give and take a little bit. But certainly, I think if there's room to reanalyze data, rethink things, um, that attempt should should be made. And and I also agree with the point that. Dr. Tang made is, you know, if you're looking down the road two years from now and uh, you got your insurance companies that's and payers that are looking at, I mean, they, they approve stuff on a very much of a guideline driven thing. I mean, you've got someone who doesn't know the medicine, but they've got a, 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 a document in front of them that's written off guidelines. And, you know, there'll be a point where half your cabbages are getting turned down for, for payment. So, I mean, I think, I, I think there's, there's a lot of prudent reasons, uh, even if it's not affected um, what we think is kind of our process of delivering care to have conversation about it and, and do the best job we can to get it right. Are there any, any other questions? Uh, just a question uh, more for the surgeons, but uh, also uh, to say that that was a fantastic overview. I agree, it's a very complicated topic and I learned a ton. So thank you to our, our presenters. Radial arteries, I know um, the general feeling is they should not be elevated to the level of memories yet, but it seems like in general, what are the barriers to using radials? Um, I, I actually looked at the VCSQI data on this uh, a couple of weeks ago to answer a, a question to our own, own institution. and it, it seems like we're underutilizing them, and I was just uh, want to know your impressions on that, and potentially what the barriers are to using more arterial grafts. Kathleen Petro, do you want to weigh in on that? Are you able to speak to that? He may have stepped away. Uh, Dan, do you want to address? Sure. That? I yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I, certainly, you know, watching the, the uh, you know, adoption of, you know, if you think back of just adoption of endovane, um, you know, after, you know, at, you know, comparison to doing sort of the long legs, you know, you know, saphenous incision. I think some of the barriers are, are just in terms of, you know, changes in practice and so forth. I think, um, you know, I've, we've had a nice luxury of here of, of having a, a fairly you know, aggressive, uh, you know, and broad broad bench of uh, of uh, harvesters that can then you know translate their experience into uh, radial and then uh, and then not only replicate that experience in an, from a to the radials but in transition that to doing endo radials as well. And I think um, that's probably I think from just from what I've seen over the years in terms of having to, you know, in my own practice change from using, uh, you know, the Lima and veins to, to, to almost using the radial 80, 90% of the time, I think it's, um, it, it is just that. Whereas before, you know, you talk about a small port incision on somebody's knee versus a long incision on an arm, 
uh, and then you, you switch that to having all the same benefits of an endoradial um, versus an endovein, uh, the conduit itself that comes out um, actually is uh, often better in quality than the vein. And so I think, um, uh, and then it's intuitive just as we, you know, it can be a little bit more fragile, but it's intuitive just as with the mammary, um, that it's not a big surprise that a vessel, you know, that's an arterial vessel compared to a vein um, that's more similar in size to your target and so forth, that you, know, you would have better results. And so I think, I think the data is strong, it's, but it's a matter of, you know, you know, going from, if you look at um, the, the, I think the, the last SCS survey, I think there was only, um, it was less than like 10% or something like that, that was uh, utilizing multi-arterial uh, revascularization. And clearly there's a, a big need to sort of disseminate the strength of the uh, data of, of uh, multi-arterial grafting. Pete, there's yeah. a lot of Thank other you. obstacles are anatomic. 6% uh, mm -hmm. of, of all of us don't have an ulnar artery. So we're very careful to assess uh, the, the flow of the viability of the hand of, with the composition of both the radial and the ulnar. Because if you don't have, a radial or, or don't have an ulnar artery and take out the radial, your, your arm's not gonna do well. The second is the anatomy uh, of the vessel that we know that the patency of the, uh, can be affected by the severity of stenosis. So if you're putting a radial into a, a vessel that is uh, less than 70%, uh, stenosis, there may be enough competitive flow that the patency of the radial may not be optimum. Um, you know, so those are the uh, major things. And I think the institutional philosophy, as Dan alluded to, is critical. If you've got uh, only 11% of sites, there's 100 and uh, I think 1,100 sites doing open heart surgery in the country. Uh, if only 11% of patients are getting multi arterial grafts, uh, it tells you that that's, it's a, it's a mindset. I think Kathleen does up to, it's almost 63% are, are multi-arterial. So it's, um, it's a big step because it takes longer. It's more arduous and it's, uh, to do bilateral mammaries in a radial, but the patency rate and the survival rate when you're looking out past 10 to 12 years is, is better with multi-arterial grafts. I'd like, I'd like to echo what Dr. Spear, I was going to make the very two points he made, and that is that, that uh, we tend not to put uh, radials on arteries that's less than 70% stenosis. And we actually do formal vascular studies on all of our patients. And I, and I would say that probably at least 40% of our patients by Doppler studies has an incomplete Palmer arch. So we, we, we typically kind of exclude them. Um, so as a society, we don't think that it's a, we think that radial is great in the, in the right, in the right place. We just don't think that it's, it deserves that rating above other uh, options, but we all think that probably we are under utilizing multi-arterial grafting in patients. And that should probably be a quality thing that, and I think in the future will be in, 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 in surgery. Great points. Are, are our radial cats going to negatively influence that as well? It, it could, and I'm glad you said that because as we as we have our uh, cardiology colleagues ask us to do more radials, we may have to ask you them to start going back into the femoral artery to do the heart catheterization. So we'll see, we'll have to see how that plays out. Great. Well, Thank most, you. most of the radials you harvest from the left arm. And most of the time when we cath, we're doing it from the right arm. But I, I do find the data from VCSQ, I assume that's correct. I, I do find the data that had been posted here with the VCSQI data and the national data very interesting. But, and this well, that, is the that, data we can, we can gather. That is a good point. I don't know about the other surgeons, Robert. We, we typically do the non-dominant arm. So if someone is right-handed, we take the left side. If they're left-handed, we take the right side. So I think that if if the radio if the radio calf was done through the dominant hand, well, it would probably uh, not be an issue in the future. Which uh, it may not be anyway, but that that's typically the way it's done. I think for most institutions. Just a, a couple of comments about the the, the radio, at least from at least my uh, just from an anecdotal personal perspective. Um, if um, there, there, well, one, there is data 
if you use a radio from a, um, a site uh, that it was previously calf from within 30 days, there is decreased patency. So I think in one of the, uh, the radial trials, um, they did show um, that it does affect. And so I think there is definitely a strong preference for, for not using the radial, at least in the short term after, after a calf. Um, it does true. I mean, I think just by sort of general, you know, practice, it does seem to work out that the left radial um, is available since uh, most of the time they're being calf through the right radial. I think our interventionalists, Madam, can correct me if I'm wrong, are, are pretty much, you know, the vast majority of times, uh, at least starting on the right radial um, uh, as their preferred uh, site of, uh, of catherine. The, um, I think the benefits of, of using arterial conduits seem to be strong enough and the morbidity of harvesting the conduit that we've, I've, I've gotten away from, from uh, even uh, questioning if it's dominant or not. Um, and so uh, even if they're uh, dominant, uh, left-hand left dominant, I'll still use the radial. I think we see a ton of heterogeneity in the uh, vascular studies that get done. And I think uh, you know what a vascular uh, technician has as a threshold for saying um, there's enough dampening to suggest a possible incomplete palmar arch has been variable enough that actually, you know, it, it, it poses a potential sort of, you know, you know, legal risk, I guess, to, you know, to say, oh, you got a study and then you went ahead and used it anyways. And I would agree with, uh, with uh, Dr. Wyatt that uh, I saw it so frequently, but it did not clinically jive with what we were doing um, that I actually stopped getting the studies for that very reason. And, um, and, and I would say the vast majority of patients have a usable left radial. I think that that 6% that uh, Dr. Spear was quoting seems probably about right. It's, it's, it is the rare patient that I find uh, that clinically has significant uh, dampening um, to make it uh, uh, you know, not feasible. Pretty much the only patient that I don't take radials on these days are dialysis patients and, you know, that where you need to save the radial for the, for the fish to. Great Thank points. You. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you all for uh, for the time. Uh, thank you for again for, for a great presentation and uh, discussion. And um, this is something we'll keep eye on and perhaps have further further conversation on. Eddie, do you want to take the take the program back over, or or Bob Shore? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Wyatt. And thank you to our presenters this evening, Dr. Tang, Dr. Tarani. Uh, phenomenal job. We are a little bit before 730, uh, which is our scheduled time of the evening. So I want to just open up the floor. Are there other questions, comments, ideas, suggestions you all have for VCSQI data, for different quality improvement work groups, um, other, other tasks you'd like to bring to our statewide forum here. Hey, Eddie, this is Chris. Uh, I, maybe you just kind of give the impression or let people know that you did a lot of work on valve data, uh, along with what has been done by Cabbage. I think they might be interested in knowing that. Thanks, Chris. And that kind of dovetails to some of the data that we just teased there on the multiple, multiple arterial graphs. Uh, our cabbage reports for Q1 will be released here uh, early next week. And we also have a, a new set of three-year valve reports, which I know it's not along the coronary revascularization theme, but it's still along our STS reporting uh, theme. It's, it's a pretty comprehensive compendium of valve data. So please be on the lookout for those. And thank, many thanks to Chris too for helping to develop that, that set of reports. Any closing thoughts, Dr. Spear, Dr. Shore, Dr. Wyatt? I just wanted to um, thank everyone for their amazing presentations. Um, I think the backbone of what we do is the collaboration between uh, the surgical and uh, cardiology communities, along with the hospital systems to able to meet our mission. So um, this is a great discussion and, and thank you very much. Well great said. picture, by the way.
well said, and thank you all for your attention and participation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful summer, and we will see you uh, via email until then. So thanks, everybody, again, and take care. We'll decide uh, prior to the next meeting whether or not we're going to do in person or end up uh, doing the virtual again. And we have a little bit of time to decide that. So be aware that we'll be trying to get people's impressions. Yeah, thanks again, everyone. Thanks.